Welcome back to the Q&A, and this is part five. Part five of a ton of questions and hopefully some answers and helpful answers, maybe. And this is a totally different format where I read the questions out loud. So if you just want to listen to them, you can just hear that and then listen to my answers. And this is all free form, what I'm thinking about those questions. And that's a different type of clip that I'm doing. And if you're wondering what I'm doing here at all. Hi, my name is JD and in this channel, I cover animation topics. I do animation analysis clips. I do acting analysis clips. I do animation topics and lectures, animation news, rig reviews, product reviews, all kinds of things. Feel free to browse around the channel, you know the pitch, and subscribe if you want to or not totally up to you, but it helps my channel grow. And that is that, you know the pitch. Let's go straight to questions because there are 10, I think I've saved 10 questions. And let's start with H3RCM. As always, usernames, I apologize, and everybody who's watching and listening, is, you're very patient and suffering through my pronunciations. Uh, and the question is, what should you do when you get a super jerk person teaching you animation? As in, how to deal with bad teachers? And someone else below replied with, um, and that is Licatus, Licatus, Lichatus, I don't know. Also, how to deal with the bad teachers that just do not care to help or really teach? That's a good question, and that's a sad question. I mean, if you are a teacher, any teacher who's watching this, <laughs> this makes no difference if you're watching or not, no one's gonna care, but if you are a teacher that just doesn't care and just kind of doesn't wanna teach, just gives them a tutorial and then sits back and is on their iPhone. I've heard of some of those teachers, I'm not gonna name names, um, it's actually, I don't remember the name, but I've heard of a case where a teacher would just come in, get their phone, screen tutorial and then just browse something and just let them do in like, you know, three hours of silence or something. That's super crazy. I mean, I would say go to the school and, and tell the officials, management, the assistants, your advisor, whoever the hierarchy works at your school, that this teacher needs to get their SHIT together uh, and do something about this or replace the teacher. I mean, this is really, because the students are paying, I mean, the parents or whoever's paying for the classes and they need to get something out of it. So that's, it's really not a good thing. Now, again, how to deal with this, I would go again, I mean, you can talk to them if you're into confrontations. You want to, hey, listen, uh, I don't feel like what you're doing here is right. I mean, you got to tell them. Like, I ask my students to give me feedback. I don't get that much feedback. And maybe there's something where students don't want to say too much because they fear whatever percussions. But I want the, the relationship between students and, and teachers to be as honest as possible. So if I do something wrong or I teach the wrong way or my Swiss accent is just horrible and you don't understand anything, I want people to tell me so I can switch my style around to help them. So if you want to, and if, if you feel like the teacher is open to that, that might be one way. But if you're saying there is a super jerk, um, then you got to go above that person and just go with management, whoever, the HR, whoever, and tell them this is just not wrong. That's kind of what I would do. Because the thing is, again, it's your time and your money. So I wouldn't suffer through semester after semester with bad teachers. Just let them know or let the higher ups know that this is just not right. Because, you know, why waste your time with that? That's just me. Uh, I would just, I would take action. PLG 3030. Okay. What is the best way to improve your animation skill while working full time as an animator? You are the best. Well, thank you. You are the best. That's a good question because that's kind of in the same, I'm in the same boats. I'm a full time animator. Um, for anyone who's new, I work at ILM nine to six, right? Depending on the hours, it might be longer, but that's my daytime thing. So. The way I improve my animation skills, that's a good question. I hope I'm improving by animating at work. Uh, what helps me is, I know this is not something that's like an easy thing, but then you have to go through all the proper channels and get into that, that territory, but teaching has helped me in terms of analyzing other work, identifying problems quickly so I can help the students quickly. And then I apply all of that to my own animations. Everything that I always repeat to my students, this is the checklist. Look for that, you know, arts and pops and acting choices and, you know, all of the things that you want to put into your shots. When I work on my own shots, I try to remember that I have my own little JD somewhere on the shoulder that repeats the same thing. Hey, imagine this is a student clip. What would you tell them? And I kind of go through that. Obviously, how, do you, how could you improve is by doing work outside of work, which I can't. I still don't have the time. But that's what I used to do a long time ago to, to try to do like different clips, like different style. If you're doing cartoony stuff, maybe more realistic, you're realistic, more cartoony or continuing with the same area, but just kind of refining. Maybe there's something at work you haven't done for a while. Like uh, actually just yesterday, I think we talked about or two days ago, I can't remember the Q&A uh, with my students. I never animated uh, on Jurassic World or Jurassic Park. I'm not that old, but you know, and within that franchise. Um, 
So I have pretty much no experience in terms of feature, uh, live action, feature animation, dinosaur, realistic animation. So that's something I would have to practice at home versus getting that and the feedback from work. So that would be my thing. So find your area where you feel like you need improvement and then practice that at home if you have the time. Uh, and if you don't have the time, critiquing has helped me. Um, and at least look at other things online. I mean, um, nowadays, it's, I guess it's online, where you see awesome animation that might be inspiring to you in terms of that's really cool. And then analyze that, like analyze yourself, not yourself, but you do the analysis on other people's work so you can compare that work to your own work. I think those are kind of the different areas that I would use to um, to improve. Um, and if you, I mean, if you really have the time and money, um, go as a, as a full-time working animator, take workshops uh, or go to a school or anything where you get feedback from someone else, like someone that doesn't know you, doesn't know your work and can kind of neutrally look at your work and say, okay, you need to this, do this, this, and this. That would be something. Again, I would love to do that. Uh, I still don't have the time. I would love to go back to school, so to say, and uh, have assignments and have a professional look at my work and, and critique the crap out of it because I need, I need more practice and that'd be really cool, but I don't have the time. Um, but that's, again, maybe I'm sure there are other ways, but right now that's what comes into mind. Moki Toby. Moki Toby? I guess Moki Toby. Have you thought of trying to use Blender? It would be interesting to see a video of you trying to learn a different software than the industry standard. By the way, the best tip for animating cars, please. I'll get two questions in there. Um, have I thought of trying to use, I have absolutely thought of trying to use Blender and it all goes back into time. I have more time before this semester, but even then I had no time. Now I have really no time whatsoever, um, but I do want to try it. I don't know if you want to suffer through me trying to use it for the first time. It could be really boring to watch uh, how I stumble through this, but I do want to go in there and see how it is. I hear so many good things and I see so many good things with that software. So I do want to use it. Um, and the best of animating cars, well, it depends. I mean, cartoony cars, look up cartoony cars out there, cars, Pixar, or the older classic cartoons or stop motion things of what their style is. Um, and if it's for realistic cars, you got to look at reference. How do cars move the suspension? And you know, if it's like a hard suspension, soft one, bouncy things, what type of car, the make of the car, how, you know, how do they lean or, you know, what's the gravity? I don't know. To me, it would be looking at real life reference to see how they behave, quote unquote. Um, and then looking at whatever tools you have, do you want to animate the car on on a path or not, stuff like that. I'm not sure if that's the best answer to this. Um, kind of stumped on that question, but I'll leave it at that. Mexican burrito, burrito. Super cool with the Q&A. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. My question is, when practicing learning, should I worry about how long I am taking on an assignment? When I sit down with my own animations, I feel, I always feel like I'm too slow and was wondering if I should just focus on learning rather than speed. That's a good question. Um, should I worry? I mean, let's put it this way. I would first worry about learning. This goes back into having a good or bad teacher. So you get the material, you, you get the assignment, you get the list of whatever you need to do, and then practice or practice. Try to understand the assignment and the principles behind it. So don't rely, actually, that's what we talked about yesterday for sure in the class. Um, don't rely on the teacher's notes to move you forward. By that, I mean, if you just get the list of the teacher's notes and just follow that list and then resubmit your shot, but don't understand why you made the changes and what the principles are behind those notes, then you will never succeed and or succeed, you never improve, if that makes sense. Like you will never, like once you go to the next shot, you don't know why you made those fixes. So you, you can never make it better on your own. So that's why I'm saying first, I would focus on learning looking at obviously your education, the principles and everything. And then when you get the notes, trying to understand why did I get this note? Why do I need to do the weight shift or the spacing change or the arc changes or the acting choice change, whatever. Whereas acting is a bit more, um, you know, subjective, but that's what I would do. But then also speed, to be honest, it's, it's a both thing, but ultimately I wouldn't, I would first focus on the learning and then the speed because you don't want to rush through things because I need to be fast and then it looks crappy. And then what's the point? So learn the principles, make sure you understand all the fixes that you're supposed to implement and then start working on your workflow to be faster. I think that would be, um, that would be my advice. 
That's a long one by Nilofar Navai. Navai? And that is actually, there's a two-parter of someone else called Sumaye Nagizade. I think this person replied before. Anyway, I have the same question as Eric Malako. I'm learning Maya and 3D animation by myself. Your channel really helps me to learn more about 3D animation. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Although I was 2D, 2D game animator, I quit my job and decided to switch to 3D because I really want to work in triple game animation, uh, game companies. I'm practicing every day. Sometimes I feel lost and ask myself, am I on the right track? Is there any specific exercise like a list or something that newbie animators start with them? Sometimes I really don't know what to do. I stop my practice and start overthinking and asking myself, no, no, maybe I should try body mechanic or no, maybe I should make some acting animations and dot, 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 quite, um, quite, quite. sorry for a long comment, but I'm about to explode and I need help. And underneath someone responded with or added, yeah, exactly. I think that happens when you self-study animation or anything because you don't know where you are in the path of learning and there's no one to tell you what to do after you did, for example, that, especially in the middle path of learning, things start to become harder and you need someone to push you. Those are great comments, great questions. Um, so let me go back up here. You decided to switch to 3D because you really want to work in a triple game, but you feel lost. Am I on the right track? Is there a specific exercise list? I mean, there's the classic 51 exercises for animation uh, that has all kinds of things in there. I mean, that's definitely somewhere to go in terms of that's the list I want to go through. These are all very helpful lists. Like it's a helpful list of exercises because you it will teach you many different aspects of facial acting, body mechanics, and moves, and all kinds of stuff. I and mean, that's for sure a good idea. I totally agree that it's hard without feedback to understand where you're at. I think what I would look at in terms of self-teaching, um, yeah, if you, again, <clears throat> you have to have feedback, because you, otherwise you are in that bubble. So either your friends post your work online in a forum, or obviously if you can to a school, which is not the thing, because it's self-taught. So find somehow a way to get feedback from someone. In terms of structure, I would look at if you're self-taught to go through the principles, like literally going down to bouncing ball. Like you got to go ha have a, a proper foundation for timing and spacing. And the bouncing ball is just easy to do in terms of it's no crazy rig, just the ball. You might have other rigs where you got squash and stretch and other things in there, but you can literally just take a sphere in whatever software package you have and go with the bouncing ball and different weights and stuff like that. I would start with that and then I would go into mechanics. I wouldn't go for a bouncing ball or like a pendulum or whatever straight to a walk. Walks are hard, especially once you get to character walks. So uh, to me, it would be kind of building on top of complex mechanics where you have a bouncing ball, the bouncing ball with a tail. So you get the drag overlap and all that good stuff. And then what I always recommend is subjective, but I, I recommend a sit down because then you can just do just the root sitting down. You don't have to do anything crazy with arms and legs. But then you can, you still have to look at the weight and the arcs and then the little pause and the plop. And then you have that impact on the body. There's still a lot of, you know, successive joints that have to overlap and compress. I think that could be cool. And then you can exaggerate or exa you can make it more complex by adding a step, a turn. Maybe the arm is leaning here like I have on the chair, lean down like that. You can make sit downs more and more complex just mechanically. And then you can start adding character to this. It's, you know, someone tired or anxious or nervous or happy or tired, whatever, all that good stuff. So I think that is one way to go. And then going into a jump, which again, could be just a standing jump, jumping from A to B, walk to a jump, run to a jump. You can make this all more and more complex. Um, and then you can, then I will go into pantomime stuff where it's a bit more thought process and, and, and character driven so that the movements are not just movements for physics and, and proper mechanics, but driven by a thought process and action and reaction and whatever it is. That's kind of what I would say, but even within that, you would be lost if you're just doing it by yourself. So I'm going to put a link in the description uh, with the 51 exercises. That might be something that uh, is helpful. But if you're, I mean, if you're typing this, you are on some form of machine, be it a phone or a computer. So you have access to, let's say, LinkedIn, or if you want to do an account, or Twitter. And I know Twitter might not be, you know, it can be a very negative, you know, hellhole, this is, dare I say. Um, just kind of curate it the way that makes it a bit more positive, but at least you can follow animators or you can, you know, follow artists where you can post your work for feedback or just ask for feedback. Again, you might get a lot of unsolicited feedback or opinions you don't want to hear from or I don't know, whatever. So LinkedIn would be more professional and uh, that would be that. 
So yeah, find a structure, an exercise list that works for you, depending on where you're at level-wise, and then go through that, but try to get some form of feedback, even if it's just someone in your household or a friend or someone. Or send it to me, or I could say worst case, send it to me, I can give you some feedback. Um, I have to prioritize my students and my workshop people, but feel free to email me. And if I can, if it's something short, I can just write a, a one or two sentences. I can always do that. So um, I will leave it at that. Vaibhav Bhatia, Bhatia, Bhatia. It's always kind of tricky. Um, how do you plan your shots? For example, if you have seven days for a single shot, then how many days are you gonna spend for gathering references or doing research? And how many days are you gonna, you gonna give to execute the shot? And is there any do's and don'ts for the shots during tight deadlines? Those are great questions. How do I plan my shots? Well, generally, it's the type of shot that's going to dictate how I plan. By that, I mean, if it's something heavy in terms of mechanics, especially creature stuff, I don't know every creature by heart. So I have to look at references. So then my first step would be online or books or whatever you have, look at references for posing and mechanics and movement. How do those creatures move or how do humans move um, for something very, very complex, you know, especially if you have you know, any type of like parkour or some action-y thing, a stunt double stuff that I can't act out. Then I got to go online and check someone, something, something that's similar to that action. If it's something that I can do, then I act it out just to kind of feel how it is, how my body moves for whatever action it is. If I, if I need to study that more, then I film myself for reference. Or if you have a good acting body, you can film someone else that does that. That that to me would be first. If it's something where I don't need reference and I just want to think about the performance and it's something where it could be a character or a creature or something that is not, you know, legs and arms and it's just something, something else, um, then I usually just sit there and think which is horrible when someone walks by my desk. Nowadays, it's not the case when I'm in my office. But um, at work, it's sometimes weird because I'm just I'm literally like this. And just thinking. Because I try to visualize the shot in my head until it's clear. Like I, I try to see it in my, in my head, like the final pass. That's the performance. That's what I want to do. If I don't need reference or I don't need to act it out. Some stuff you just kind of like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Then you go in there and you animate it. That's kind of what I do. So how many days do I spend for gathering references? uh a day i don't want to spend more i mean you can always start with the basics do something submit your shot for review and feedback and then keep looking at things and looking for more references while you wait unless you have a second shot to work on and you do the same thing you keep working so i don't want to spend too much time basically i want to spend enough time to make a good decision i don't know if it's going to be good but something that's at least informed enough to start um, so I don't want to spend four days on something where if my idea or my pitch is not good, I just wasted four days. I prefer to do half a day or a day, get a blocking together, send it as an idea. And then when you get feedback, hey, that's a good idea, keep going. Then you can continue with reference gathering for more details or more polish or whatever you need. So that's kind of my process. Uh, and any do's and don'ts for shots during tight deadlines? Um, I don't know, keep it, to me, it's keep it clear. I don't want to make things too complicated once I have a tight deadline. Say, okay, well, this is the shot, this is the deadline, don't have too much time. Let's not spend hours and hours and hours for reference, trying to find some crazy details. I start simplifying it into what does the shot need? What's the story point? What does the client need? What does the lead or supervisor need? Um, and then try to execute that idea as clearly as possible. And then once that has been approved, then I can add some other flourishes to the shot to kind of dress it up and make it cooler but um i don't want to go into crazy stuff when it's a really tight deadline then it's just stick to what you need to do like what needs to be read as clearly as possible in the shot story point wise or, or pose wise um and then i put on some music to drown out everything and just have you know a certain mood and then uh, and i go in and attack the shot it's very subjective I, that's kind of what i do i don't know i should comment if what's i'm curious what other people do what are other people's do's and don'ts for uh, tight deadlines? I'm curious what your your distraction-free zone thing is that you go into to uh, to get there. I don't know. All right. Naman Kari. I'm, again, assuming the pronunciation here. How do you plan action sequences for game animations or action movie where it's tough to find or make reference? This is a common question that comes up a lot. I don't do game animations, so I can't answer that. And for action movies where it's tough to find references, it's kind of like, for me, it's a two-step thing. It's basically, I 
look at reference. Now you're saying it's tough to find, but I tried to find reference that is at least somewhat similar, even if it's extremely removed. Some part of whatever you're going to animate, you will find reference for, even if it's just a certain body move, a look, an arm, a grab, a fall. There's something that you can go, this part exists somewhere. Now, if it doesn't, then the answer is just make it up. Then you just gotta rely on your experience and all the things you've done, make up an idea and then go and animate it. I mean, ultimately you still have to have the skill set of not looking at any reference and think about a shot, come up with an idea and animate it from A to Z, you know, final polish without any reference or help. I would still practice that type of thing. So, but I still try to find as much as possible in terms of reference, so it's, it's related. If you have a creature, right? It's like some fantasy sci-fi creature that looks totally weird. You still want to find something that obviously won't look like this, but as an audience, the audience will go, oh, that seems familiar. They don't have to have that m massive reaction, but subconsciously they can go, you know, if it's like something threatening, you might find an animal that has a threatening stance or pose or move. And you know, like, like snaky stuff, like snakes, right? You use a snake that's gonna be threatening. So if you're any type of creature does like a, a threatening snaky thing, then you're gonna go, you're just gonna feel like that's not right. That's not like a cuddly creature. So I would look at that, like what elements can you, can you choose from whatever reference, human or creature, that an audience member is going to react to viscerally in terms of cute or not cute. Like if, if you, like there are obviously many other ways of reacting to something, but like those basic good or bad, bad or evil, or evil or, or not evil type of things. Um, and then once you have that, like I said, then you just have to make it up in your own head and, and create that performance and just rely on your sense of timing and spacing for the proper weight and then your sense of timing and drama and entertainment value to make it a performance. Hope that makes sense. That's kind of what I do. Again, not saying I'm doing it well, but that's my that's my approach. This guy, that's the username, this guy. Sorry, 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 one more last question. How do you give breath and settle to a character, especially when we have like four to five frames? Damn, that's really tough. Um, if you only have that much time, I mean, the breath is gonna be, Four or five frames is so short for breath. I mean, it's, it also will depend on the action, right? If you're just doing a, you don't have time. Like four or five frames is not gonna work. Now, if you're doing something action-y, it's like, and you can do something like a cheek puff or like a, a chest flare, then that might fit in. But four or five frames is super short. I will look at something where I settled her character. I will look at what is the action you're ending and what is the main aspect of the body part that ends? Is it, Something where, you know, if someone comes to a stop with their leg and it's like this, where it's the leg is gonna hit the root and the pelvis for the whole thing to stop. So you're gonna feel something in the chest. It's gonna be a chest head with potentially an arm move, but it's gonna be a lot of compression or just the stop. I would, I would try to sneak that in there because you can, you have to potentially stop the root really quickly. That doesn't feel natural. Like it feels like it's too fast. So the momentum has to go somewhere. So then any body part where you can show that off, where it's a chest or the head that follows through or an arm that has like an overshoot for it, where you feel like that momentum just doesn't stick. And if it's just a regular settle with not a lot of action, it's the same thing to me. If it's, if I'm resting and it's like a, I don't know, it's like a chair on this, then I would look at, this is the thing that stops first and it might be the settle on the head. So like a little, a little adjustment on the head to finish this. If it's a standing thing, weight shift, it could be your hips, could be an arm. Um, I would just look at what is, also what is the thing that needs focus? I know I'm kind of all over the place, but there's so many ways you can approach this. So you have to look at a, at a mechanics way of the momentum, so it looks proper in terms of how a character stops. But at the same time, you have to look at in terms of where is the audience supposed to look at the end of those four to five frames? So it might be something where mechanically you, you're supposed to do like a, a body compression, upper chest, whatever, but the focus should be on the face because then there's something there or it says something or it cuts to something where the eye needs to be up here, not down here. And however the eye line is for across the cut, then I would exaggerate the head so that if you stop, the last thing could be a bit of a, a like a twist in the head. And that's the biggest thing that moves. So the eye goes to that part. If that makes sense. You have to lead the audience in terms of focus if that's the frame, right? So let's say I'm stopping here. That's my head here and the next shot has another character within this area, I would move that at the end so the eye stays there. I don't want to do something where something happens over here, right? And then in the next shot, the audience is supposed to look here, but then you have a lot of back and forth and it kind of, it's, it's a jarring cut or 
um, stuff like that. So that to me, that's what I will look at in terms of mechanics, what would feel right. And then on top of that, well, would that be overwritten by a performance where you want to focus on some, some other body part? And then that again will be overwritten in terms of, but how does that work? If it's a sequence, how do you cut to the next shot? Where do you want the audience's eye to stop so that the cut is smooth and so on and so on. So I think there are many ways. Hopefully one of these is helpful to you. Robert Goodnight, that's the name. When you specialize your reel for a studio, how do you analyze the studio's work to match your reel to what they do? Like if you apply for Blizzard, what sort of things do you show for that? If you're going to apply for ILM, what sort of animation would you prominently show in your reel? Like, would you go for more real, real action scenes, real as in R-E-L, if you're listening to this, not R-E-E-L, uh, since it's a VFX studio, unless stylized slash cartoony, and Blizzard is more stylized action. I hear a lot about specialize your reel to the work the studio does. Yes, and I'm also a, a, the same proponent of, of that saying. Um, you know, again, it's that example, I mean, go broader in terms of, let's say ILM and Disney, like Disney feature animation, totally different styles. So broadly look at what is the general style um, and then go from there. And then once you have that, like let's say ILM, now I don't, I mean, I work at ILM, but I'm not gonna represent HR or the recruiting aspect, or this is not an endorsement of, if you do this, you will get a job. I know this sounds like a massive disclaimer because it is. So what I'm gonna say now doesn't mean that if you do that, you'll get a job, I have to say this. So, but for ILM specifically, I would do something where looking at the portfolio of what we're doing, like, like Mandalorian season two is out, right? You got the crate Dragon, really awesome. Stunt doubles with Mando flying around. Like you have digital stunt doubles that you can apply to maybe bigger creatures. So you have, look at Transformers, big robots. You have Pacific Rim, big creatures. Um, you have Star Wars, you got flying vehicles. I would not put Star Wars on your reel, but something where it's a vehicle flying, so you have flight dynamics. And then we also do a lot of camera work. So a lot of the CG stuff, like CG cameras, we do, like we get it from layout, but then sometimes we have to do a pass on top of that, or we have to create the whole camera from scratch. So anything that would be camera work, because maybe you do previs or post uh, work. So to me, it's leaning more that way versus a cartoony stylized looking character doing cartoony animation with lots of you know cartoony stuff in there, um, because that's just not what we do. Um, that would be the biggest thing. So look at your reel in terms of the style. And then within that, just look at what has the company done recently and apply it to that. Like you can look at, you know, some companies are doing the effects stuff, but it's not actually, it's a bit more, a bit more like performance room. Like a lot of Harry Potter stuff has creatures, but then they talk, they perform um, or anything, stuff like that. Again, you have to look at some companies are more into the performance VFX. Some are more actiony creature stuff. Some are doing everything. So that's kind of how I would uh, approach that. Again, disclaimer, that doesn't mean that you'll get a job. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Hope that makes sense. Basically, it should be the disclaimer of everything. I hope that any of this makes sense, anything that I say. All right, let me just check the time. Oh, 29 minutes and 30 seconds. This is why I'm looking down here because last time it cut me off. So I'm going to stop this. Oh, there's one last question. I'm going to stop this and re-record and then finish this with a new recording. All right, I'm back. I could have cut this out. Look at that, my timer. I'm gonna leave all this in. This is all something that I'm doing. This guy, again, is asking, it's the last question. How do you manage to do YouTube plus your daily work that to uploading every single day? And what do you think about anime? <laughs> I like those double, double, totally different questions. And then funny enough, I was just talking about anime yesterday with um, my wife's younger sister is here. Uh, it was a lockdown. They're kind of living together right now. And she watches a ton, a ton of anime. So she would be the uh, better person. Well, actually, you're asking what I think about it, but uh, talking to her about it yesterday, like I'm so old, like my anime thing is, you know, like Dragon Ball, uh, Les Chevaliers de Zodiac, the Saint Seiya, whatever, you know, the Zodiac, or whatever it's called in English, whatever. Um, you know, and then I don't remember the couple ones way back when I was a puppy. Uh, I, and even though it was in Switzerland, I, we watch French channels and there was a channel called, or a, a show called Club Dorothée. And she and her co-hosts would present all kinds of shows, also anime stuff. And there were a ton there. I don't know if Ken, Fist of the North Star was part of that lineup, but like there's so many different old school um, anime uh, shows that would watch. And that's kind of that. I don't really watch them anymore because I don't, 
the time that I have to watch things, like the time that I have in general, I want to spend with my family. So I'm not going to sit down and watch anime with my wife because she's not super into that. So like Castlevania was like the last thing that I watched that was animated in terms of a non big feature thing, I guess. Um, and I know there's a ton of good stuff out there. Like there, I say I've barely seen anything of Avatar. I know, I know. And Korra or even Clone Wars, not that Clone Wars is anime, but just generally animated TV shows. It's just, it's just hard to find the time. So what do I think about it? I like it. But again, my liking of it is uh, steeped in nostalgia and very old, uh, old shows that I used to watch. I'm sure by now you got a lot more and better. And I know you do, but I would say, how about this? This guy uh, comments and let me know what your favorite anime shows are or movies, anything in that style. And then I can make a list and uh, catch up and watch these or anybody watching these. What are your what is your what are your what are your thoughts about anime and what are you your favorite movies and TV shows? Uh, and then we can go from there um, and then I can catch up. The other question is, how do you manage to do YouTube plus your daily work? Well, it depends. That's my, my favorite answer to everything is always it depends. Um, right now, I have a really hard time uh, to manage it. If you are watching my clips more frequently, if you're if you're a subscriber, you will see that my schedule is now completely upside down. I just don't have any time right now. I have, like I said before, I, I teach five classes. I got three classes at the Academy. Uh, they're all online, obviously, right now. I got two classes uh, at I Managed Mentor and I do my workshops as well. So my my world right now is is heavy leaning towards teaching with the daytime being work. So any free time at lunch, I exercise, but that's just basically teaching, working, exercising. And in the evening, I watch uh, Ted Lasso, I just finished. I watch TV shows with my wife and movies, stuff like that. Or Mandalorian Tonight. Um, that's kind of currently uh, the bubble that I'm in. Now, there were too many classes. It's usually because classes that I applied to sometimes get canceled. There are not enough people there or something changes. So it's usually give me all of them because I know at least for the academy and mentor, one of them is going to get canceled because of not enough people there or something changes. So I never have that many. For some reason, everything got approved this semester, but I'm not going to do that again. So there's going to be a certain cap that I want to put in, especially for the academy. Two, like the two on-site classes, which are online, like the online classes, you just, you write stuff, you critique, but it's kind of my own schedule. I kind of go and log in and, and record the reviews. But the on-site classes, which are now online, there are three hour blocks. So for me, that's Tuesday, Thursday, from 6 to 9 p.m. that I have my block. So that's like a big chunk uh, that's gone. And the Thursday class is so big that it's actually 6 to 10. Like I have to do extra critiques and stuff. So that's a big chunk of time that's just gone. And I can't do that anymore. So for spring, I would only do one on-site online class and then an online if they, if they want me to have me come, right? But I'm not, I can't do two on-site slash online classes. It's just too much. An evening, three hour chunk uh, is kind of gone. So I kind of I have to really pull back because I do want to do other things uh, besides what I'm doing right now. They say there's a like a clip I want to animate to for I don't know how long. Um, but also for the channel, as you can see, like a lot of stuff has just been on hold. But I want to continue and I need to find a way around that. I just I just don't want to work on weekends. That's the thing. I don't want to critique, I don't want to animate, and I don't want to work. I don't do anything on the weekend. Weekends are my, my work-life balance thing. I want to spend that time with my family. But it comes to a point where people, again, have sent me stuff to review. And if they are watching this, again, thank you, and I will review them. And this weekend, I'm going to break my rule and I'm just going to work. Because I need to catch up and I can't just say, hey, send me things for a review, and then they do for free. And then I sit on them and I don't review them. It doesn't work. So I just, I have to change it. I talked about that with my wife and, you know, we, we're figuring out a schedule so that there's still family time there, but I cannot almost like take advantage of people sending me review units and then I don't do anything for it or delay it massively because I can't wait till December until the semester is done. Like, it's ridiculous. So actually this weekend, I'm going to break my rule and start working. So I'm going to catch up, lots of unboxing and reviews, um, and then I will try to find a different schedule to get back into the rhythm of Rig reviews, um, FNAs, all that stuff. Because again, it helps me going back to another question. Like all that stuff helps also me to learn more and and dissect stuff and have more material for other classes and not just the channel. Because I try to do material that will serve the channel, but 
all my students, so all the classes. I can show them that stuff. I can point them towards the movies or the extra material that I have. I can show them in class. So I, I need to get back into that. So how do I manage right now poorly? <laughs> and um, in the previous semesters where I had less to teach, um, I'm, also, I'm also doing a side project. I can't really talk about that needs my attention in the evening. Uh, and because of that, I sleep in in the morning where I get up at between six or seven. Before that, when I didn't have that side project, I got up at quarter to five. And this is how I was managing my stuff, where quarter to five, I get up and I do the critiques I need to do. I record, I edit all that stuff up until eight or nine until work starts. Then it's work, 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 work. And then in the evening, I can do family stuff or my own thing, what I want to do. And that was kind of the schedule. And then I go to bed between 10, 10, 30, maybe 11, but usually between 10 or I, I, I guess roughly between 10 and 11. I do want my six to eight hours of sleep, preferably seven. So that's kind of, that's how I used to manage it. A very rigorous morning schedule to get everything done, day work and then blah, blah, blah. And right now um, it's a bit tricky. The thing that I can upload every day is our critiques. Cause I will always critique my workshops. And I have, again, like eight, 900 files of critiques from my 10 years of teaching. So I have so much material in terms of feedback that I can, I can upload all the time. I mean, I, I would have, three years worth of daily uploads of just feedback. So, and given the comments, people like them and they learn from them. And it's also kind of a, a promotion for my workshop where I got workshops, link description, all that good stuff. So, you know, if people watch these feedback clips and go, that's cool. And they feel like I want to do that for my own thing. That's why I'm posting it. It's, it's an archive reason. And for people to watch this and get interested and then sign up for a workshop as well, if they feel it's helpful. So my daily upload will always be critiques, which again, I try to keep them Monday to Friday, uh, Monday to Wednesday, and then Thursday is ACK analysis and Friday is an FNA. Again, right now it's all just chaos. So yeah, that's that. It's a long answer. What is this? Eight minutes into the last answer. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think I have after this 10 more, 10 more uh, on YouTube. But I got other questions on my Instagram and some on Twitter, and I think some on LinkedIn as well. So there'll be two more parts. One to finish the, that's not true. And then I got questions on my answers Q and A's. So I will probably say three more parts. One more part to finish that the, the comment list there. One more to cover the extra questions on, on those Q and A answer clips. And then one last one to round up all the questions from all the different social media uh, sources and that is that. And speaking of that is that, that is that for this Q&A. Again, what is this? 10 minutes, so probably half an hour, 40 minute almost clip. Very long. If you're still watching, thank you for watching. If you're still listening, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Uh, and you know the pitch, like and subscribe. Subscribe if you want to, you don't have to, but it helps the channel grow. It would be awesome. Comment if you have any questions, of course. Comment if you have any clarifications. Comment if you, if I missed a question, I probably missed something somewhere. And uh, that is that. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a fantastic weekend. And if you're watching Mandalorian season two tonight, it actually comes out at midnight this morning, but uh, let's all sit together mentally and watch episode two of season two. It's gonna be awesome. Anyway, that is it. Thank you.